deliverance. Winning from behind is what I entitled the message of today. And I've been struggling over this weekend with how to present what I have to present. Uh, partly because what I want to present to you is not a sermon that I formulated from different passages of scripture, but simply a presentation of one chapter of the Bible. Okay. I really just want to read a chapter. And uh, today's service is a service dedicated to God. And we have some of Sister Francois's relatives who are here today. And we specially invited them to come today. Amen. They had a debt in their family some time ago. And they are remembering the one who passed on, but more so looking forward to the new life that they're going to live as they think of the memory of the one who passed on. Okay. They want to especially pray with you today that God will be very close to you. And this chapter of the Bible that I want to present has special meaning for us all. I told Sister Francois, you know, we don't normally have a, a service for the dead. But we don't ever have a service for the dead. All the services we have are for the living. Yeah. Yeah. When a person dies and they bring the casket into the church, it's not for the dead because they can't hear. They can't see, they can't know. But out of respect for the life that they have lived, and to find closure as a group and as a family, we, we, we come here and we talk, and we, we remember special events, mm -hmm. and we think about the contribution they made, and we think about the advice they've given to us. Yes, sir. And we just pray that we would live true to what we know to be God's will. Amen. And last year, we had so many, many funerals. We were bombarded by sadness. And today I want to tell all the other groups who we didn't specially invite. If you suffered loss during last year, this service is also for you. As we lift up the name of Christ, but as we search into the word to see what God has to say to us. All right. And as we make a pledge to move forward in faith and to live in connection with Christ. And so I've chosen a chapter where one of the great preachers of the Bible struggles with his own journey into Christ. Most of us are obsessed with a journey that leads us to Christ. But he was not obsessed with the journey that led him to Christ. He was obsessed with his journey in Christ. You see, there is a journey that we take to get to Christ. And to get to salvation. And every now and then, people get so caught up with the idea of getting to Christ. And getting registered as candidates for the kingdom. That they think that's all the journey we got to do. But the Apostle Paul tells a different story today. 
Those of you who are acquainted with his writings would be acquainted with his struggle expressed in Romans 6 and 7 where he said that which I would I do not that which I would not that I do describing the drama that takes place within a person who gets called by Jesus Christ. And what Paul described there was a situation where he, hearing the call of God, accepting in his mind that this is what he wants, but finds his body not cooperating. He's struggling with himself. The metaphor he uses as he came to the crescendo of his cries. Said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That metaphor I heard described as, as a child, I heard a preacher say, back in the day of Paul, we had different ways of executing people. The most well known is the way chosen to execute Christ. He was nailed up on a cross and allowed to hang there. And in hanging on the cross, he would, they would nail you up through the hands and the feet and plait you and tie you up there, making sure that they do not sever any major artery or vein. And so you don't die from a loss of blood. But you are hanging on the cross. It's uncomfortable. And to breathe your diaphragm must distend. And the distending of the diaphragm brings extra pressure on their wound. And so you are squirming there. And this would go on sometimes for three days. And then the people finally collapses more from mental pain than anything else. Dies. That was the, the, the execution that they chose for Christ. But they tell me that there was another cruel execution. If a guy committed murder, they would tie the person that he murdered to him. Hand to hand foot to foot. Time around the middle and send him out in the wilderness alone. And as that person who is dead obviously is going to stiffen up with rigor mortis, the living one can't break loose, he can't untie himself and he's trapped to the body that he killed. If he is lucky enough to stay long enough until the body begins to decompose, then he has the stench to deal with. And then part out of exhaustion and the, 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 the stench and all the disgustingness of that situation, he would finally die. And it is said that when Paul said, Oh wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from the body from this, of this death? Is that metaphor he is using? In other words, I got a dead man tied on to me. I know where I want to go. But me is keeping me back. A dead me is strapped to this me that wants to proceed. That has been for many years the most famed drama that we hear of the life of Paul. Not the only drama. Those of you who read the book of Acts will know that the early life of Paul was filled with another drama. He was a persecutor of the Christians. And I'm going to read that here in the chapter. And as a persecutor of the Christians, he would 
tried to arrest as many of them because they were preaching Christ and he thought Christ should not be preached. It was illegal. It was a distortion of the truth. And so he would go after them to jail them, to beat them, to inflict punishment on them. As a matter of fact, he was there one day when a young deacon named Stephen stood up to defend his position. And instead of preaching a normal little word or give a little personal testimony, or instead of just telling them some, some, some quick thing, no, 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 no. Stephen didn't do that. Stephen went into a long report. <laughs> Beginning with the covenant of Abraham, he traced down the line like in a courthouse before a judge and meticulously showed point after point where the Jewish people were given the promise of the gospel and then he proved to them in legal style how they rejected Christ. And when they killed Jesus, that was the God that they killed. So convincing was Stephen. That the argument stopped. They chose not to speak anymore. Instead they blocked their ears. They put their hands in it. We can't listen to that. They rushed onto him. And stoned him. Stoned him. And as he was about to die. As the sharpshooters smacked those bowls at him. His face started to shine like a light bulb. Mm. They tried to snuff it out, but he, in a fixed gaze, Amen. looking up to the sky, he says, Father, yes. lay not this sin to their charge. They don't know what they're throwing away. With his normal eyes, what he could not see before, the God of heaven allowed him to see. And he stared straight into the throne room of God. And at the throne of God, he's pointed, look, Jesus, the Son of Man, he is on the right hand of the Father. I see the heavens open and the Son of Man is there. Lord, lay not this sin to their child. And they kept stoning him. He, he, he overcome with the physical obstacle said Father into thy hand I commit my spirit it's okay he shut his eyes died but the noises kept on in the head of this guy Yes. didn't throw a stone he held the clothes of the people who stole him. His name was Saul of Tarsus. And when the drama with the people ended, the sounds remained yes. in his head. You could hear those stones smacking on Stephen. And in between the splatter of the stones and the crowds crying, he heard a signal voice says, I see the heavens open. Yeah. And the Son of Man, Jesus, is in heaven and he's sitting on the right hand of the throne of God. He Amen. is God. Amen. 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 Quiet the voices. He got more arrest papers and went to lock up more people. And that war was going on inside him. On the road to Damascus, Jesus knocked him off the horse with a bright light. When he hit the ground, Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Voices. And uh, Jesus said something to him that is chilling. He says, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Yeah. I tell you. 
the gold stick, there was a gold stick that the, 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 the shepherds would have. Not too sharp a point to cut skin, but sharp enough to nudge okay. them. And they would use the gold stick to keep the sheep in track. And Jesus said to him, it's hard for you to kick against those gold sticks jamming in you. This is the son of God. Mm. And he says, Lord, what will you have me to do? Jesus told him, go. He said, this Ananias will help you out. The guy had no struggles. He struggled with this, struggled with that. But what I'm talking about today is the most intense struggle that Paul had. Why he decided he wanted to win. And I say win from behind. Philippians 3, I'm going to read it, the entire chapter if you don't mind. And if you'd like to read along with me, you get the privilege of reading from a different translation. A translation that I find very helpful. Verse 1, finally, my brethren, and I want you to feel, I want you to feel this old preacher writing back to a church that he used to pastor. Concerned about their condition and their safety. And also giving them a little peep into his new struggle. Finally, your translation says, for the rest. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you, to me indeed is not grievous. It's not a problem for me to write what I wrote already. But for you, it is safe. It's to your benefit. And he starts by saying, beware of dogs. Vicious dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Your translation will tell you the circumcision. For there are the circum for we are the circumcision, he's talking about as a Jew now, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. He says, Not all Jews are Jews. I'm a Jew, circumcised, but I worship God in spirit and in truth. Amen. Though, verse 4, I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof that he might trust in the flesh, I have more. Of those circumcision clan, they celebrate the fact that they are the chosen of God and they do everything right. They are obsessed with doing things right by the letter. Nothing wrong with doing right. But when you decide to do right by the letter for the letter's sake, you end up wrong. Because you lose focus. You're doing what is called a good thing for a bad reason, so it becomes destructive. This is why Paul says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Verse 4, I'm continuing. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, though I also have something to boast about. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I have more. This is my life story. This is my resume. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, I'm hardcore Jew. In some other places say Jewish to the bone. A statue of the law concerning the law, I'm a Pharisee, the most strict group of law keepers. 
Concerning zeal, what? Persecuting the church. Concerning righteous, the, the righteous, which is in the law, blameless. I was a perfect Jew. But what things were gained to me, all that resume, those I counted for loss. Yeah, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of my of Jesus Christ, my Lord. I count not just that, but every imaginable thing, I will throw it away. In exchange for a knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And do count them but dumb. That I may win Christ. Verse 9. And be found in him. Not having my own righteousness which is of the law. But that which is true faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. He says, I give up everything. I give up the pride. I give up the stats that I could show to get this different quality righteousness. A righteousness that you don't work for. A righteousness that is given to you. It is made and perfected outside of you and given to you. Faith of Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Amen. That I may know. <laughs> Help me somebody. That I may know him. One. Two. The power of his resurrection. resurrection. Three. The fellowship of his suffering. Being made comfortable unto death. Conformable unto death. Let's read it from your type. That I may have on the screen knowledge of him. I want to know him. And the word know in the English language is sometimes a little soft and weak. When the Greek language spoke about know, there were two words that were commonly used No, One is to identify. To say, I know, I identify. And the other is to be involved with, to yes, know. Yes. You ever remember in British law, people who uh, had illicit relationship with young people below a certain age, they were charged with having carnal knowledge. Yeah. To know. And Abraham knew his wife, what that was saying. They entered into an intimate sexual yeah. relationship. Yeah. So to know is to get wrapped up involved in it. That's the know he's talking about. Yeah. That I may have knowledge. I want to know him. I see him. I hear about him. I read about him. I touch him. I tell him I love him. But I want to know him. I want to have knowledge of him. And I want to understand how he did the resurrection thing. Mm -hmm. Talking about a journey. After meeting Christ. Most people are just worried about the journey to find Christ. 
And they struggle to, so that I could say, I am in Christ, I'm saved, and I'm right. But Paul has put that behind him. He says, now I have received the righteousness of God. I have thrown away the righteousness of my works and law keeping and doing good and all that. I have cast that aside and I worship God in spirit and in truth. And so now I have a, a righteousness that is given by Christ. And now that I reach this righteous, somebody please listen to me. Yeah. And now that I reach this righteousness yeah. that was given by Christ, Amen. I don't want to consider this the end of my race. No. I want to start a new race. Yeah. Now I want to start. I now want to know him. Now that I've left legalism, now that I've left known sin, now that I've left even unknown sin, and I am covered with the grace of Christ as he wrote to the church in Rome, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now that there is no condemnation, now that I'm saved, now that I'm free, hallelujah, I want to know him. Yes. That I may have knowledge of him. And of the power of his coming back from the dead. I want to know how he did it. Yes. Locked up in the tomb by himself. The devil's quaking because he said he'd come back. Nobody went into the tomb. He alone in there. But the Sunday morning when the angel Gabriel came and said, Son of man! Thy father called thee with nothing going into the tomb. He came out of the tomb. Amen. He says, resurrect. I want to know how you do it. Yes. I want to understand you. I want to know you. I want to understand how you, how you resurrect yourself. I want to understand the power of coming back from the dead. And I also want a part with him in his pains. I don't just want to read about what happened on the cross. I don't simply want to hear. I want to feel it, please. I want to feel it. When you're on the cross and they, 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 they put the crown toss. <laughs> Let me feel it, please. And I part with him in his pains. And then at last he says, becoming like him in his death. I want to even die like you. That I may know him. Now that I'm completely saved. My past is behind me. The struggles are below my feet. Everybody looked up to me as though I have attained everything. Now that I'm at this level and we are one, I want to know you. Yes. I want to understand the resurrection process. I want to feel what you felt. I want to creep into that process of dying and like how you died. <laughs> Verse 12 continues. Not as though I have already attained. Either we are already perfect. Either we're already perfect. But I follow after 
if that I may apprehend for that which also I was apprehended of Christ. Let's read it in this translation. The King James says, not as though I had already attained. It says, not as if I had even now got the reward or being made complete. No, no. But I go on in the hope that I may come to the knowledge of that for which I was made a servant of Jesus Christ. I didn't reach where I'm going. I ain't even pretending that. I ain't pretending to be perfect. But I want to get to the place where I understand you. Yeah. And when I get to that place and I understand you, I will understand why you call me to preach. Yeah. I don't just want to know I'm called. I know that already. But I want to see in your mind. I want to feel what you feel. I want to experience what you experience. That I can look back and see why you, high and mighty, could look at this piece of nothingness and call me to preach? Why? Why? I want to know you. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in God in Jesus Christ. Forgetting what's behind. I'm pressing, straining for what is ahead. To enter into a new experience. That I can understand what's really going on. That I can understand why was allowed to handle <coughs> eternal riches. Paul once said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Paul makes the gospel of Christ <laughs> The power of God and the salvation. In other words, he makes it of, as it were, of equal power with God. This is the power to save. And God give me that power to use. I come like an electrician working with super high tension voltage. Or working on a nuclear plan and I am allowed to flick the switch. Or sit in political office. And when nations around the world start doing foolishness and it seems as though they want a real war, I have the, 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 the position as president of the United States to push a button and wipe off one third of the world. And I, human being, simple, ordinary human being, get the power to handle such eternal things. I get the privilege to tell my neighbor across the fence, Jesus will save you now. But not just gossip, I'm not gossiping. I get the official heavenly power. God says, if you say it, it's done. Tell it. Yes. And I'm privileged to handle something so precious. I want to 
understand some of this, he says. Continuing, he says, let us, verse 15, therefore, as many as be perfect, your translation will say, as many as have come to a full growth. Matthew. Let us, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Let's have this mind. And if in anything, he be otherwise minded, if any have a different mind, God shall reveal him this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind this. What we what ground we cover already, don't go back on that. Right. Brethren, be followers together of me. And mark them which also walk as ye have us, for examples. Follow those who go in on that track. For many walk of whom I have told you often. Remember you talk about the dogs and verse 2? For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping and now in tears with sorrow are crying and telling you that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul was saying back in his day that there were leaders in the Christian community, in the church, and their church Jewish community, that he described as agents of the devil. Yeah. Religious leaders, teachers, they are enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame. Who mind earthly things? What he is saying is this. There is a reason why some of those leaders are locked in as failures. Whose goal is just to barely satisfy themselves. And the reason why all this happened to them, whose mind is earthly. They are reasoning things from an earthly perspective. They can't grow. They have a glass ceiling that shut them off. Because the earthly they reason everything based on common sense and the bottom line and the penny and the dollar. When you can only think earthly, you're in trouble. You want to make a decision to walk with Christ. But all you're asking for is the instruction book to take me from here to there on earth. No use getting it, you know. Because God's book shows all the way to heaven. Amen. And if you say to him, I want your book, but only give me the earth portion. So I only want to decide what is comfortable for here and now. Waste of time. Waste of time. It's a sad thing how people are lost. Sitting on the edge of salvation. Why? <laughs> I tell you this, don't forget this. There's only one way for people to be saved. And there's only one way for saved people to be lost. And it's the same way. Same way. Doing good, keeping commandments, helping people can't save you. 
You are saved only by an acceptance of Christ as the Savior. Amen. And once you get that declaration, saved. You're going to remain saved, even if you sin. Even if you sin plenty. <laughs> even if we get fed up with you, you're still saved. The only way a saved person can lose their salvation is by reversing the same thing they did to become saved. It's only by rejecting Christ, by turning around the same decision. And this is why Paul wrote so much to the church people and scolding them and warning them because some of them could sin. And they're not lost enough. They're still saved. God doesn't give the salvation as a tryout, you know. Our salvation is permanent. The salvation that God gives is permanent. So when you come to church and you hear the voice of the Lord and you decide, I am going to give my heart to Christ, Lord, I accept you, and you accept Christ, it's permanent. Amen. Even though you get tempted to do something wrong, that doesn't change it. Now, there are some false teachers that Paul is talking about. Earthly teachers. Who go out and teach people that it is not, not just that it's permanent, but that it's unchangeable. That's not Bible. You get permanent salvation. But that permanent salvation could be withdrawn. If it was temporary, then when you sin, you lose it. But it's permanent. So when you sin, you don't lose it. But it could be withdrawn. Let me try something different to help your mind because some of you... Your minds and working as fast as your ears. <laughs> Jesus met Nicodemus one night. Yeah. And Nicodemus, who was a good man, practicing good things, living a good life, feeling this emptiness within him, mm -hmm. and seeing the confidence of Jesus and his disciples, he said, Good master, what shall I do? In other words, I did. 127, 100. I, I can't remember, but I did plenty, plenty good things already. What else could I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, it's not things, you know. You've got to be born. Yeah. Again. You've got to be born again. Amen. Salvation comes from a new birth. And if you had listened to the rest of the conversation late in the night, I could imagine Nicodemus asking, Good Master, what would one of your people have to do to lose the salvation? He says, Same thing. So, what do you mean? They got to be born again. Like Judas. Just as how he was born into Christ went and made an arrangement with the devil where he is born again into the devil's camp. And when he is born into the devil's camp, he has lost all connection with the Jesus camp. So his salvation, which was permanent, was revoked. Paul is saying, brethren, I'm writing some things to you all. 
It's not a problem for me to write the same thing again, you know. But it should be helpful to you. And better you, more you hear it, more you'll understand, you know. Because this is serious business. What some people don't understand is that God is not to be played with. Because when, oh goodness gracious, when you play around, things could happen, you know. Boy see girl and uh, exchanging little sweet eye and wink, nothing born. They shaking hand, nothing born. They start to get comfortable and so they're hugging and kissing, nothing born. And when one day the hormones take over and they go too far. And they're feeling so strange, you know. The strangest thing was the first touch. But after they touch and touch and every day, touching and feeling strange. And then they kissing and kissing every day, kissing and feeling strange. And then they end up lying down the same place, and they're feeling so strange. And then they leave and they go home, coming back to hug up and kiss again tomorrow. And the girl says, I'm pregnant. <laughs> catastrophic change and this catastrophic change does not come about because of any catastrophic expectation most of the time you hear somebody say I'm pregnant and you say no why unexpected it didn't feel like anything different. And don't talk about those bigger people who have all their experience. And so they cut straight past the kissing and the touching and they go straight to the bed. <laughs> and them have sense, them know about rhythm, method and this method and that method and, they, uh, and then they're pregnant. How come? No. It's strange. <coughs> what happened? Something is born when you least expect it. And they are church people who are given eternal, full-fledged, permanent salvation. Mm -hmm. But they're sleeping in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't know when all of a sudden something else born. You see, because the change from saved to lost does not come with thunderings and lightnings. It comes with a simple carelessness and you're practicing some carelessness, and you're slipping, 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 and you thought you were just <laughs> slipping, not knowing that you fall. Yeah. Paul said, beware of dogs. Yeah. Because people who get permanent salvation, could end up messing up because they're too earthly, their belly is the heaven. Mm. They're just studying the self, their rights. Mm. I wouldn't let nobody take advantage of me. Nobody can do this and that. You, 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 you. Yeah. Mm. You're on a slippery slope. Mercy. Mercy. Because there are ways that you travel. You enter into Christ. You heard the gospel. You accept his truth. Boom. You are declared saved, justified. Amen. You are given. You are given permanent Amen. salvation. Yes. And now you have a choice. To run back and experiment and touch. 
and see how prominent it is. How strong it is. What you could do and get away with. How long you could get away with it. You could try that. Paul says, I'm not going in that direction, brethren. He said, I want you all to follow my example. I want to know him. I want to understand the power of his resurrection. I want to step into his suffering. I want to get into his mind to understand why he called me and allow me this. I, I, I don't want to go in that direction. I want to go up. Don't want to mess with the earthly. I'm dealing with the heavenly. And this dynamic life could take you out just as easily as it could take you in. Beware. You have an enemy. A devil. Like a roaring lion. Walking about seeking whom he may devour. He will pull you out. Mercy. Don't trust him. He will pull you out. Paul says, earthly minded people wasted time. Verse 20 says, for our conversation is in heaven. For our country is in heaven. Our residence is in heaven. From where the Savior for whom we are waiting will come. Even the Lord Jesus. You know, my, my obsession, I'm looking to heaven. Looking with everything. Sometimes anytime you hear me talk about money in this church, it's, it's in this context I talk about it. My money is recorded in heaven. And everything I do with money is on the basis that I'm going to heaven. When I give gifts to the Lord, that's, that's, that's the context. My, our conversation is in heaven from whence we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. He says he's going to change our body. He says this body that I have is going to be changed uh, not uh, just into better but into one like unto his. I said here once I'm going to preach a full sermon uh, on the topic that I advertise unnecessary roughness. Yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to preach after I've preached that. You know why? Because most people in this country understand sports. And in football, which just finished recently, you could be charged with unnecessary roughness. It's a rough game, and they understand it's a game of hitting. <coughs> but if you hit out of time and late, they penalize you for unnecessary roughness. Mm -hmm. The quarterback has the ball, and he's going to throw it, so his receivers will catch it and try to score a touchdown on the other side. And you, uh, the defensive team, you're allowed to hit him as <coughs> hard as you want, <coughs> legally. And those guys are nasty, you know. In the huddle, they also are verbally nasty. When they run down and they see you with the ball and they hit you, they stand up and they look at you on the ground. Don't come here again. Next time we come, we kill you. Don't bring that here. You could hit him as hard as you want. When you get a concussion, you don't say sorry. But after he has delivered the ball, right? And he's 
stepping back from hitting the ball, if you hit him at all, you are penalized. And the language they use is unnecessary roughness. A receiver has the ball, but he's running up the line with it, and he step out of bounds, and when he step out of bounds, you come crashing on him, bang, you hit him, they say, no, 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 unnecessary roughness. See this last verse? I, I, I get a sense that God wouldn't be displeased if I use unnecessary roughness to describe Bible. You know, the Bible teaches that the living know that they shall die. Yeah. But the dead know not anything. Death is a state of non-consciousness where there is no recognition of time so that dead people don't wait so many minutes. You're dead, that's it. All time cease. Amen? Yeah. But in an effort to comfort people, some preachers who don't preach the pure Bible tell some lies that they think are acceptable because they're trying to do good. One lie they teach is that our mother and father, and brother and sister who died, they are now in heaven. Oh, they are up in heaven. And as soon as somebody dies, say, oh, he's looking down on us. And they make a lot of noise about, oh, this one is looking, this one is in a, he's in a better place. Yes, yes. Jesus said when they die, they stay dead. Yes. He is the resurrection and life. Yes. He is the only one who didn't stay. Yes. Yes. Paul says, I want to know, I want you to tell me why you didn't stay. Everybody else stays. Then, non-conscious. As a matter of fact, it's such a big issue in heaven that the Bible says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And when I hear that, I have to use my football language and say unnecessary roughness. Why mean unnecessary? In other words, that is unnecessary talk. Because if everybody is in heaven, why we have to bother about death being destroyed? You're talking about unnecessary roughness? Let me give you unnecessary roughness. The Bible says that Elijah was taken away from this world and he went up in a chariot of fire. Unnecessary roughness. If everybody else who dead gone up, why are you making a story about Elijah going to be the chariot of fire? Moses died. And when he was died and buried, God took him to heaven and Satan competed with Jesus for the body of Moses. Jude say, unnecessary roughness. Just that talk is on. Why have that Talk about David is not ascending to heaven. Hey, if everybody as they die, they go to heaven, then all that talk need to stop. Yeah. <laughs> and death, why do you have to be afraid of death? Why do you have to afraid to die? This world has always been described as a wicked, hard, evil place. Every record of heaven say it is a nice, pleasant place. Mm -hmm. It means that if I lose my job, I need to close my eye and pray. God, send me up. So all this talk about who going up and who up there, imagine this big drama, Jesus up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Moses and Elijah come down and tell him, unnecessary roughness. Okay. 
The only explanation for all that the Bible is saying is that that's a lie. The yeah. dead stay there. They in their grave. They don't feel the passing of time. Paul, Paul said something that sweetened me. And this is the Lord talking to the dead, essentially. Here. Not to the living now. Paul says for me, absent from the body, present with the Lord. In other words, the minute I die, the next thing I know is Jesus. Because there's no time to wait. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all die, but we shall all be changed in the same moment. All who get in change, change time is coming. Now, boom, everybody change same time. One change moment. Yes. And so no suffering, no waiting. But we stay in a state of non-consciousness until the master calls us. With that in his head, Paul says, Lord, I give up my self-works. I give up my self-recommendation. And now that I am completely and totally saved, I want to know you. I want to understand your resurrection. I want to feel some of your pain. I want to experience the death like you have received. Until the time when the Lord shall come, who shall change our vile bodies, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things under himself. He could have set everything straight. Everything straight. And so he says, I press forward to the mark. I have a new agenda. The old agenda I started off with of getting saved, that agenda changed. Because I saved already. So I'm not concentrating on what I already have. It's new business we're after. I now want to know Christ. I want to understand. I want to study the Bible and not just to not and read and I want to get inside the Bible. I want the Bible to get inside of me. I want to understand the power of God. Until I reach the point where I understand why God actually saved me. And Paul says, all those who begin have sense, tell them, let's go on this journey. Let's take this walk. Let's take this walk. I feel to pray. I, feel to, I want to pray for somebody. I want to pray for somebody. I want to pray for somebody. If you have a special need to be prayed for, just stand right where you are. I want to pray for somebody. If there's anybody here who has not given up their past life of sin, but you want that permanent salvation that God gives. I'm going to invite you to come forward and stand right here with me. <coughs> if I have to explain it more than that, you weren't listening to me. But if you want to receive God's salvation, permanent salvation, you're not sure you have it, and this is not something to be maybe about. Come. I want you to stand on the side near the piano. On this side near the organ, I'm going to ask those who have suffered bereavement and want to come and ask God today to pronounce a blessing on them. And there's a family here that needs God's special blessing. I want all of you to huddle together right here. 
Come and huddle together right here. We want to pray with you and pray for you. Just come on this side. And you come right here. I believe there's somebody in this church who needs a special touch from God. It may be that you have just found out what God wants you to do. And now you want him to give you the power to do it. Please come forward and stand right here and join me. Congratulations. You found out something you didn't know before. Come out here. And there's one person I want to come who needs a flat out miracle. Either in your body, in your family, something. Not everybody, but somebody needs a special miracle from God. And we're all going to pray for that miracle of God on you today. I want you to come also. As we bow our heads together in prayer. We serve a God who can do any and everything for us. Any and everything for us. And God handles all kinds of situations. Amen. Anything that the devil could tempt you, God handles that. Any situation you could get that you inherit from your parents, God could handle that. Any situation that you could end up in because of carelessness, God can handle that. And any of you have anything that you can't explain, God could handle that. There's one other person who needs to come here. Come quickly, let's, let's, let's pray with you. With our heads bowed and eyes closed. There's someone else who needs to come quickly. You, you know why you need to come. Maybe that you were not saved and you need to get salvation. But maybe God has opened your eye to something today and said to you, you may never see it this clear again. Come. Eternal God and Father, we give thanks for the privilege of being here and for reading your holy word. Speak peace over us. Just speak blessing on us. Speak forgiveness on us. We want to lift these persons who have suffered bereavement. Yes, Lord. And I've come into this church today to say, God, we honor the memory of those who have gone on. Mm -hmm. And we are coming that you will bless us mm -hmm. so that we would live in such a way that when our time comes, we will be sealed. Yes, we will be sealed mm -hmm. for God. Amen. Touch each heart. Quiet the fears. Mm -hmm. Let each one know that from this day on, they put everything in the hand of Jesus. They don't have to carry any worry, any fear, any bother anymore. It's all now in the hand of Jesus. Amen. There are some persons, Lord, who are standing here in this church who never made a complete surrender to you because of guilt that they carry. And the devil is so wicked that he complicated their guilt mm -hmm. by making them feel partly responsible mm -hmm. for that guilt. Mm -hmm. Set them free, Father. Yes, Lord. Holy Spirit, just knock away the record. Like a flood of water, wash away the record. Let it be that when they wake up, they will look and see that all their sins are washed away. Amen. Amen. Cast in the depths of the sea and remembered no more. Grant us all the privilege of knowing
that you are our God and our Savior. And those who were not saved before today, Lord, accept them into your salvation plan. Yes. Give them now your permanent salvation. Yes, Lord. And those of us who have lived with this permanent salvation, help us to be careful with such a precious gift. Amen. Help us not to live carelessly with such a precious gift. Lord, there are some persons who have found a new focus in life, a new ministry, an understanding of what you want. Give them the power. Holy Spirit, anoint your people so that all those who have their direction straight will get power to go in that direction. There are some sick people here who need your touch. Oh, great physician, like you did so many times before, zap them with your power now. Yes. Defy logic, defy medicine, yes. just heal them. Yes. Because you are God. Do it because you are God. Amen. And Father, to the non-verbalized prayer, there's a prayer so private that it couldn't come out loud. But you who sees the heart, knows everything. Yes, Lord. And that quiet prayer that was not verbalized in one person because they feel it was too big for you. Mm. And another one too ashamed to say. Mercy. Grant the answer to that prayer right now. Yes. And let the words of our mouths meditation. and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable, be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Hug three people that you know. Hug three people that you know. Shake hands with two people that you don't know. Let them know that the power of God is theirs. Let them know that the power of God is theirs. Closing songs 517, my faith looks up today. 517, my faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary. Have two more people that you know. Let them know that God is in a good mood as it were, in that he is forgiving, he is blessing, he is healing, he is saving. Congratulations. We all Don't stand, keep please. good news to yourself. You need to tell somebody. Find one of the elders and tell them what God did for you today. 5.7. Meet somebody and tell somebody what God did for you. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. My faith looks up to me now, Lamb of Calvary. Tell him if you mean it. Tell him if you mean it. Stand. My feet looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior, Savior, Divine. Now hear me while I pray.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being with us today. We thank you for your closeness to each heart. We ask, oh God, knows that we have heard, we have realized what we have to do, who we have to be, whose we are, that we'll go out and share your love with others. Thank you. Bind us with cords that cannot be broken. And Lord, when you do come, may all of us who are here, who have heard that message today, together with those that we will talk and let know of your goodness, all of us will be saved in the eternal kingdom. When you come, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. you all to come. Uh, even before fall, there's going to be something on the screen that we can all be benefited by. Let's come and spend some time together. Amen. Amen. Let's come and spend some time together. God bless you. Amen.